Okay. Well, thank you everyone and welcome to the Trends presentation for Reawaken Spaces. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Um, special thanks to everyone that's dialed in from across the world, for those people in London where it's first thing in the morning, a special thanks for getting up for this presentation. Wherever you are in the world, no doubt you've had a challenging year. Um, and uh, that challenge, I guess, is, is largely lifting across the world in, in, the, in the parts of Australia. For those of you from Australia and New Zealand, in other parts of the world, it's still an ongoing challenge. Um, but regardless of uh, whether that's still a challenge or not, the report that we're going to present today will be of relevance at some point in your journey as you start to return to what will be a new normal. And as spaces become more open and people start to use those spaces, there'll be new challenges that, that we will face as a world. Um, we've done this sort of trends reporting for the last uh, 10 years at Brickfields Consulting. Um, we usually produce um, something on a quarterly basis, which is the place edition. Before that, we were producing the place report. It's not the only thing we do. We don't just get to travel the world and have lots of fun. We also um, do general consulting work, um, market research, customer experience, and place strategy work as well. Um, in terms of what we're going to present today, I'm going to hand over shortly to Stephanie Bim, who's going to take you through the four trends. She is our Associate Director and leads our trends and consumer research section here at Brickfields Consulting. Um, so she's worked very hard with the rest of the team to try and very quickly produce a report. It was the only time we've ever done a trends report that's been so heavily influenced by timing. Um, so hopefully we've hit the mark in terms of the right information, the right case studies, and the right insight at the right time to allow you to make decisions, to take advantage of those opportunities as they present in the future. And wherever there's change, there's obviously always opportunity to be had as well. So I'll pass over to Steph, who's gonna take you through the four trend areas. And it's a very easy way of getting an insight into the background of each of the case studies without having to actually read the report. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. Um, I'll twist the screen around. Cool. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us um, to echo David's sentiments. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and share this research with you. And so I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay. So that should be visible. Good. Okay. So as David mentioned, we've got four trend areas that we're going to present to you today. They are, as a quick top line, um, they're nothing groundbreakingly new, but what they are is an acceleration of trends that have already been building pre-pandemic. And COVID-19 has all but accelerated these and made things a lot more possible in ways we didn't imagine before. So as a quick top line, the four trends are supportive systems, so new levels of solidarity that have emerged between neighbours, retailers and businesses and that are impacting our places. We have recalibrated spaces, which is the rapid repurposing of spaces to suit unforeseen needs and create new opportunities. Then we also have people first mobility, so this is new implications for transport that create higher quality lifestyles and safety. Oh, really? Is that working now? Sorry about the tech difficulty, guys. We'll be with you in a sec. Yes. Yeah? Oh, okay. okay. All right, so continuing on, people first mobility. So these are new implications for transport that creates higher quality lifestyles, but as well as autonomous vehicles that have created, um, found a new niche, given the case of health issues. And then the final trend is slowed down culture. So the time spent at home has really seen us curate our lifestyles at a gentler pace, and some of us prefer it. So how we engage in social and cultural experiences might change, and this is gonna impact our places. Equally, how we access food has also changed, and this shortened supply chain preference might also change how we slow down and create our own food.
So I'll begin with supportive systems. Always good to start with the feel good stuff first. So during the peak of the pandemic, it was really heartening to see a new sense of solidarity emerging between neighbours, helping each other, between business owners pivoting operations, and also property owners really caring for their tenants um, through new models and systems. And some of these initiatives may well last the recovery period. So looking at retail specifically where shopping centres are concerned, we witnessed an aggregation of retailers into centralised platforms to boost trade while keeping shoppers safe. So one great local example that emerged was Mervax Essentials Express. So this allowed shoppers to purchase from multiple local retailers from their assets through a single click and collect platform. So the convenience experienced in this type of operation may see customers expect this as a permanent offering. And if this takes flight um, and this non-discretionary spend is freed up, um, that creates other footprint space for more, a more experiential proposition. So we'd already seen shopping centres pivoting towards experiential offers prior to the pandemic, but now we have other systems in place to make it more possible. Another aspect of supportive systems is community capital. So, um, that's a strengthening of social bonds. And one of the most heartwarming responses has been the increased sense of community we've seen around the world. Uh, research by the Food Foundation in the UK found that 40% of respondents noticed a stronger community feel in their local area. And in terms of actual behavioral change, 39% were checking in more with their friends and families, and 11% were even starting to share food and toys and books with their neighbors. So it's really amazing the level of community spirit that we've seen. And this manifested through a number of different initiatives. And one of my favorites is the Voice of Brussels bus. So this is where locals could submit voice messages of support and hope. And the buses would drive around different neighborhoods and broadcast them over loudspeaker. Um, and this was a lovely solution for um, loved ones who are kept apart, but particularly for older generations who probably weren't that tech savvy and able to communicate through digital platforms. And so as we launch into the recovery and applications like this specifically aren't necessarily applicable anymore, what is applicable are these moments of joy and genuine sense of community that residential developers can really start to think about how can they implement these moments that people are proud of and can get behind and um, really enjoy about their local community and also provide a competitive edge too. The final aspect of supportive systems are conscious companies. So this is where businesses have pivoted during the pandemic to support a higher purpose. And this is in line with Gen Z and millennial preferences that were building before the pandemic, which have seen many global companies um, build their own corporate social responsibility. And we know that 75% of Gen Z and millennials will favor brands with a genuine social responsibility and will retract loyalty if they don't. So it's a really important growth area. And during the pandemic, in terms of spaces, we witnessed the transformation of restaurants and pubs into community kitchen, kitchens and grocery stores. One great example was by Jose Andres in the US who flipped eight of his kitchens into community kitchens for affordable meals. And so this rapid response sets a precedent for how space can be utilized in the future during off-peak periods with a particular focus on social good. So for example, for cafes that might shut on a Monday or early on a Sunday, um, you know, we've got tenant owners that could look at how these spaces could be utilized to support other groups in the communities and really build, um, build on that sense of solidarity that we've emerged from the pandemic with. To wrap up with some insights and implications on this chapter, we are likely to see home buyers placing a greater value on residential product and master plan communities that are hyper-local and self-sufficient. So they're really gonna look at um, product through the lens of, does this have all the amenities I need? Is it walkable? Is there an active fostering of community? 
and would I be proud to live here? And then in terms of retailers, um, we're likely to see a move towards more holistic omni-channel retail that is a blend of the physical and digital and potentially a reduction in tenancy footprints. So moving on now to recalibrated spaces. So this chapter talks to how places have been rapidly repurposed um, to meet changing needs brought on by the pandemic and also how we transition through the recovery. So this is manifesting through the reutilization of assets. And while we've seen repurposing space happen for a number of years now, what this moment has shown us is that certain asset classes that were previously considered inflexible or single use have now actually surprised themselves with the multitude of uses that they can actually serve. Um, airports in particular are an asset class that are doing this. The Vilnius Airport in Lithuania has repurposed its tarmac to support a drive-in cinema, um, which has been a wonderful experience for people to keep safe, but also have a sense of social livelihood. Um, recalibrated spaces is also, <clears throat> can also be in terms of reconfigured layouts, particularly in the context of retail, but also in terms of workplaces and how we transition back into the workplace. I guess for those of you who have started returning to the office, I'm sure your first days were quite tentative with wondering what the etiquette is in terms of how close to get to people or how to use the communal amenities and share the tea and or not touch certain things. Um, so a few solutions have emerged um, to support that. One is the Six Feet Office by Cushman and Wakefield. So this was rolled out to much success in China and helped about 10,000 companies return to work and has served as a guideline for other companies around the world. So as you can see in the image, um, um, floor treatments have shown six feet delineations for where people should stand close and apart from each other. And they've also created a recovery readiness handbook to support all the other softer sides beyond the physical space of organisational change. It's also likely that um, prop tech platforms will continue to emerge throughout um, the transition. And one in particular is Occupancy Now by SkyFi. And this is a tool which combines real-time data communications and automated counting technology and creates a visual output of where people are in a building, what spaces are most popular, what times of day are gaining most traction. And so that allows tenant, tenant, um, tenants and landlords to make more informed decisions about how they manage the return to work. So while these two solutions I've just presented are really excellent tactical ones, um, what we also need to think about is a more macro view for the long term of how what we've experienced during the pandemic of remote working, are we more comfortable, are we more productive, um, does it really support our teamwork, and all these different nuances, um, and how these will translate into a longer term workplace experience. So I spoke to Tika Hessing, um, a tenant advisor at Cushman and Wakefield, and she summed it up really well, saying that we should fundamentally more question the why we are going to the office, and the focus needs really to be on acknowledging our diverse needs and circumstances and how we can enable people to have um, um, more options and choices to do their best work and support their lifestyle. So I think this will be a big question um, for different companies and the answer will be different for every organization's unique needs. Looking at retail now, a number of designers and um, urbanists have begun speculating how we access different open air spaces, um, particularly farmers markets. So this is one concept by Shift Architecture Urbanism, which rethinks the farmers market and decentralizes it into a series of smaller micro markets, which utilize small pockets of urban space. If you can see in the diagram here, this is representative of all the smaller places of experience that could be had rather than one central location. And so while um, as we transition out of lockdown, this particular concept might not be completely relevant right now, it does open up the question regarding 
how could we more equitably distribute amenity throughout a neighbourhood or a region? So to look at the implications for this area, <clears throat> there could be a stronger imperative for designing spaces with inbuilt flexibility, adopting an approach of long life, loose fit. The recent years of, of bushfires, other natural disasters, and now the pandemic has made us realize that we need to design spaces that are flexible and that we have the capability to flip for unforeseen uses. We may also see a decentralization of amenity for more equitable distribution of services. And in terms of a long view of the workplace, um, we are gonna question its purpose and its role for collaborative activities, building team culture. Perhaps we'll see a stronger investment in digital tools to support remote working. And also perhaps localized co-working spaces may emerge in other, in other general neighborhood areas. So people who want to work in the area but can't work from home have a separate option. Okay. So looking now to people first mobility. So the imperative for safety and better urban lifestyles has acutely put the human experience at the center of how we move around our cities. And we've seen the acceleration of mobility as a service trends, but also new purposes for autonomous vehicles have emerged um, in the plight to keep people safe. So looking at cyclable cities in particular, um, we've witnessed many cities around the world um, reallocating space from road space from cars to pedestrians and cyclists. Um, something that placemakers have been beating the drum about for many years. And um, so while lots of cities have expressed an enthusiasm to do this, um, for me, one of the most distinct approaches was taken by New Zealand, who created the Innovating Streets for People Pilot Fund, which um, they've built into national policy. So really creating a pathway for long-term change. The pilot invites cities to access funding for programs that make it safer and easier for people to get around public spaces. So that could be widened pedestrian pathways or cycleways, and we'll cover 90% of the funding for these types of projects. But what's really critical to the projects is that applicants must express how their proposal will create lasting change, and they must have an action pathway to that. Um, so it really shows the New Zealand government taking seriously the gains that they've made in the pandemic and how they can be built on rather than just being an optimistic flash in the pan for a moment in time. Um, and one critic said that if nothing else, it takes away the last excuse that cities can't afford to do initiatives like this. Autonomous vehicles have also um, found a renewed purpose for themselves in the wake of the pandemic in a way to keep people safe and um, distribute goods. At Brickfields in March, we launched the COVID-19 Business Impact Tracker research tool where we um, track the tenant sentiment of retail customers. And through that, we discovered a marked rise in a preference for no face-to-face -face interaction in terms of delivery. And with shopping centres in particular, over 70% of respondents would only visit for contactless click and collect. So at least in Australia, we can, we've seen a big preference for um, contact free delivery. And so a number of um, autonomous vehicles around the world that had already been exploring these options um, now have a stronger validity. So one example is neuro robots in the United States, which is a grocery delivery buggy. Um, these were used throughout the pandemic to supply goods to vulnerable individuals and older generations that couldn't go outside and access supermarkets. And they were also used in field hospitals in California to ferry medical supplies between the different teams, again, keeping um, the frontline workers safe. Um, it's also important to note um, through our research, um, and I'm sure that many of you who watch the news have seen this, that, public, that the pandemic has really highlighted a number of inequities, particularly in the US, um, which is even more pertinent in recent weeks. So um, 
Research from the Department of Transit revealed that of the remaining public transit users, 92% were commuting to work, 20% were working in food prep, and another 20% were working in healthcare. And of that remaining 70%, um, they were earning less than 50K a year. So this really builds a profile of people who are critical to the functioning of our society in these times, but were also left, left in a semi-unsafe situation. Um, so going forward, um, public transit is going to need to better cater to these groups. And to wrap up this chapter in terms of insights and implications, tactical initiatives will stand a better chance at lasting change, particularly cycle lanes and widened pedestrian pathways if they're backed by government policy. We also might see an accelerated adoption of autonomous vehicles um, which may occur to support public health and inclusivity of older generations. And as I just mentioned, a better and safer public transport system to support essential workers and minority groups will need to be rethought as well. And then now the final chapter is slow down culture, one of my favorite ones. So while the pandemic caused a profound amount of distress for so many people, it also diffused the frenetic pace of our social and cultural lives. And this is concurrent with growing, with, um, growing trends in the wellness industry, the mainstream adoption of mindfulness apps, but also preferences in ethical consumption that I mentioned before. So in the context of the built environment, we're likely to see customers exercising more discernment over how and when they venture out for social activities. Um, even though I'm sure there's a pent up need for people to go out. Um, I think after the initial surge, there will be a more balanced consideration. Um, and also how we engage with travel and where we get our food are likely, is likely to reshape urban agricultural systems. So looking at this in terms of virtual platforms, um, so at the height of the pandemic, we saw the rise in virtual experiences particularly in arts and culture, which allowed institutions to remain relevant, but also allowed people to curate um, their social lives at a gentler pace. So a notable example is London's Soho Theatre, which launched an on-demand streaming service showcasing the theatre's plays and comedies. Um, you could watch a play for as little as four British pounds. And um, the Opera House in Sydney did other similar things. Similar, similarly as well as the Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and other regional arts groups in the UK, all launching virtual arts festivals, tours, talks, live games, classes, and performances. And so while these digital platforms can never replace the energy and tactility of live experiences, what they have done is democratize access to arts and culture, particularly for those on low incomes, but also for the time poor and those living distant from institutions. And for some virtual experiences may well become a new preference. These quieter moments have also given us an opportunity to reconsider how we might better manage the capacity of cultural sites, particularly those in Europe, um, like in France and in Venice that um, are really highly patronaged. And so, um, you know, we might start to consider how we balance commercial imperatives with a more sustainable visitation model. Another aspect of slow down culture is slow travel. So attitudes in this sector had already been changing prior to the pandemic, um, with air travel also losing its seal among the eco-conscious. So a few years ago in Sweden, a new word entered um, the vocabulary. And this was um, Flugska. I said it right, I'm checking in with Haiti, my Scandinavian colleague, um, mean, which means flight shame in regards to climate guilt. So and there's evidence to match this sentiment. Um, in 2019, a survey by Swedish Railways found that 37% of respondents were, chose to travel by rail instead of air, and this was up 20% from the previous year. So we're seeing a real behavioural change to more sustainable modes of travel. And now with global flight bans in place, consumers are keen to engage in travel experiences, but have no choice but to opt for slower options and staycations. 
Um, and so as lockdowns lift, tour companies are launching um, experiences with a smaller radius and for a shorter amount of time. So for example, For the Love of Travel is a global company that has launched a weekender series where a small group of people from the same city can go on a weekend tour to somewhere in a 300k radius of their town. And so what this does as well is really help um, local struggling small businesses um, that do need to build, rebuild their own economy. And so while I believe there will still be a desire for far-flung travel, um, I do think that these local options will reacquaint and ignite a new interest in more sustainable and localised travel um, that wasn't there before. And then finally, the last section of slowed down systems is regenerative systems. Um, so where shortened supply chains and localised agriculture um, may come to the fore. So I think a lot of us had a moment of reckoning when we couldn't access toilet paper or pasta or pesto or some of the really basic items um, that we were used to having. And so this, this brought about an, a host of new behaviours. Um, the Food Foundation in the UK discovered that 38% more Britons were cooking from scratch more regularly and 16% were eating more fruit and vegetables and 3% were growing their own food. And th further to this, another 3 million people ordered a veggie box direct from a farmer for the very first time. Um, these trends were also mirrored in the US and Australia. And what this signals is that consumers are placing a greater reliance in the, and trust on resources that are closer to home. And if this growth is maintained, it builds a case for a stronger investment in urban farms and food production systems. So this micro trend is part of a, a bigger narrative that's been developing in the residential sector where regenerative, regenerative agriculture and self-sufficient systems are being built into residential product. So one particular example of this is Regen Villages in the Netherlands, which is a scalable model that sees the creation of um, a closed loop system of I think up to 10 villages that all share um, their own water production, um, fertilization systems, biogas power. They all grow their organic vegetables, farm their own fish and chicken and recycle waste. Um, so this is a really interesting model. And as longer term, as consumers start to, have to prefer more self-sufficient um, ways of being, we might see that these preferences enter the residential product market. And so to summarise up this chapter, um, consumers, the time spent at home with virtual experiences, have seen consumers have a more acute awareness of the quality of their homes, and thus residential product will need to be a lot more generous and comfortable to meet these expectations. Um, people are gonna look at balcony spaces, natural light, um, with even more awareness than before. We might see it, oh. Nearly finished. Yeah. We might see a trust in local food systems, as I just mentioned, and also a management of over tourism and capacity of cultural sites. And could then we see a more equitable or a decentralization of cultural spaces in our neighborhoods to rebalance um, the pressure put on our main sites. And so before we move on to a q and I just wanted to wrap up with a quote from one of our um, one of our esteemed colleagues, Dr. Natalie Allen in New Zealand. And she put it really well to me when she said that in terms of this period of momentous change, um, what we've realized is not only that change is possible and survivable, but big steps for the benefit of many can be made with haste. And if anything, I hope we've learned that the time can always be now. So I hope the report has shown you all the possibilities that are available and it's only been a tight edit of them. And um, yeah, I hope for the best for the future. So now I'm gonna, David's gonna join me. And if you've got any questions for us, we'd love you to post them in the chat. We've already got a few ready to go um, from some of you out there. Thanks so much. If there's any more questions, feel free to, to add them in even at this late stage. Um, thank you, that was great. Yeah.
that was good. It's obviously a very broad um, cross section of examples across the world as well as across different sectors and, and applications. But already you can see some trends emerging around um, uh, social trends, environmental trends, obviously medical and health trends, but even spatial trends that are directly in response to the need for um, for distance, I suppose. We've got a few questions here and, and um, I'll ask you, Steph, just to share your thoughts and we can both probably give some thoughts, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you first. Um, this is an interesting one and it's probably one that comes up a lot in conversations about COVID-19 and the changes that are taking place. It's really a question around how do you know what you're doing is not a fad? It's not something that, that is just done as a knee-jerk response, and it, 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 but rather that it's a response that has longevity. Are there any signs that um, you look for in identifying case studies mm -hmm. that, are, um, that have that longevity? Yeah, I think, um, I think the sign of longevity is having a long-term plan. And so for that example, in particular, that example I presented from New Zealand where they've embedded tactical urbanism into national policy, though they've started small with something tactical, to, to be successful as an applicant, you have to have, um, you have to show how you've planned for change over the long term. And so when you're, I think when projects are accountable in that way to lasting change, that's when they'll be more successful. Yeah. Um, as yeah. opposed to fads. Yes, as opposed to fads. Yes, and there's things in, in the examples that you show which are almost basic human drivers of behaviour as well, which I'd imagine are mm. more stable things, like the idea of um, being acknowledged by others even though you can't spend time with a, a Belgian example and so on. I mean, they're, yeah. they're sort of truths of human desire regardless of, of the time and the context, I'd imagine. Well. Yeah, and I think looking to the more macro things um, happening in our world as well, like, Climate change is undeniable. Um, looking at the preferences of younger audiences in terms of their preference for ethical brands and companies, um, I don't think that's going to go away and that's only been building in the last few years. So I don't think they're fads um, yeah. either at all. Yeah, it just might have sped up other things that were going to happen anyway and it's sort of hastened those. Yeah. Um, second one is is another interesting one and it's for, for all those people that are that are tuning in that are the owners and operators of physical spaces. Um, I suppose this is this is really the heart of, of the COVID-19 challenge. Um, how will our behaviours change long term when we're offered cultural retail experiences online that, albeit aren't as good, are uh, very convenient and it might have changed our behaviours? What, what's the role of physical spaces and places long term when so many of us have been well served by online experiences to supplement that. Um, I think, yeah, that's an interesting one. It's a really big one too. Um, I think even though we're all physical distancing at the moment, I don't think the need, I think the need for socialising will always be there and the need mm. for experience, especially when we've been kept isolated. I think people have enjoyed a slower pace of life for sure and I think that might integrate um, going forward. But I think, I still think that places will be places of experiences. Physical yeah. spaces will be that of experiences. Will be points of attraction. Mm. Um, yeah. And in some ways, I mean, it, it probably is just an opportunity to, to try all the benefits of both online and, and physical. And yeah, they both play a role in some, in some way, shape yes. or form. But it's always nice when you're given the option to, to choose from yeah. one or the other, as opposed to having it forced upon you. Yeah. Um, the next two questions that we have are around specifically around food and food's an interesting one because mm. obviously that's the thing that most of us missed um, first and foremost yes. when we were locked in our houses and, and there's amazing information that the Australian um, supermarket chains provided in terms of our, our food dining taste changing very extensively and very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, Making sourdough. And yeah, sugar. things like that and, and, and certain ingredients being, you know, being far, far, far more... Um, bought during a certain period of time um, and so we, we were essentially trying to replicate that physical food experience mm -hmm. and the next couple of questions talking about that the first one was um, did you come across any examples of relaxed permits for outdoor dining obviously we know the benefits of, of outdoor when it comes to COVID-19 mm -hmm. were there any examples in, in Australia or across the rest of the world where that's done well yeah um, in the UK uh, 
group of businesses lobby together to create what they called um, the Grand Outdoor Cafe. And they lobbied to the government to um, relax permits so that they could start trading again and fill up the different streets and squares of London. And while that's been an interim solution, um, it will be interesting to see whether that um, changes the culture of cities and outdoor dining. And, mm. um, you know, we know that that's, that places like Italy do that really well. But for countries that haven't done it so much, like London and Vancouver, it'll be interesting to see if that becomes a permanent fixture for them now that they've had a taste of it. Yeah. So. Second food one is the role of food courts and how mm. that will be impacted in the future. Yeah, I think that one's really interesting. Um, I think there are lots of like short-term tactical ways that might quell initial anxieties, like having mm -hmm. partitioned um, seating areas, um, a bring your own device ordering system, so things remain contact free and you just order um, on your phone from the different retailers. Um, I don't think things will be self-service for a while, um, just to mitigate touching. Um, but longer term, as we were discussing earlier, um, David and I were chatting about how food courts in general had already been shifting away from this kind of, you know, squish as many people in as possible and creating more kind of hospitable experiences where we've had different seating typologies and banquettes and booths that are a lot more spread out and more comfortable. So I think we might see more of that emerging. Um, I think the plastic screens up are a knee-jerk reaction um, that aren't actually very comfortable or very lovely or inviting. So I think in the longer term, we're gonna see designers be a lot more creative and um, hopefully create some really beautiful responses for how we can you know, have a bit more space around us. Um, We've also got some online um, uh, questions as well mm -hmm. that have come through. Um, so, uh, first one's around office owners in particular, because there was some specific office examples and obviously what we're facing right now is very much um, the, the pinch point for offices around how do we get people back into conventional professional offices, you know, get them up in lifts, accommodate them on floors, make sure that there's not too much mobility, bring services to them and so on. And the question is around um, how these trends um, and recommendations can be incorporated into their thinking. Uh, yeah, you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you go, for it. You go for it. Well, I mean, I was only going to say that uh, what we find with with um, trend stuff, and and you'd be able to talk to this as well, Steph, is that um, it's quite broad in terms of its its context. So we're we're mm -hmm. taking a very a, a global view at things, um, mm -hmm. and we're also looking across sectors. So anything that's built environment, um, whether that's retail, office, you know, leisure, hotels, airports, and so on. Um, and as such, it tends to be um, extremely broad in its, um, in its view, so very macro in its view. Um, I think if you're going to apply these sorts of trends, um, then there's always going to be a filter around what's most relevant for our particular sector. And then the second question is what's most relevant to our particular cohort of, um, of tenants and customers because everyone's got a different portfolio. Um, so for instance, um, those of you with industrial portfolios are probably finding that they're less impacted by these sorts of COVID-19 challenges. Those with very tall towers um, in professional office locations um, probably finding it far more challenging. Um, in terms of how to get people up there and accommodate the movement of people and so on, and, and obviously cleanliness and other operations. Um, to cut a long story short, though, it probably requires some degree of translation into to understand your context. So there's lots of different sectors that this could apply to across many different um, regions of the world. Um, so it definitely requires that degree of translation, and we certainly um, assist clients with doing that um, to make it a lot sharper in terms of what your strategy might be. Yeah. And then, think, yeah. Yeah. No, no. I was just echoing what you said. I think context is the big thing in applying trends. Um, you know, you can't always just pick up one thing and move it to your context and expect it to work. Um, so, yeah, there is always a degree of fine tuning based on your audience and your organization. And then the second question we have there is, a, is an ominous one. It's probably one that we all want to ignore because it's referencing the second wave the doomed second wave and what mm -hmm. that might mean, in particular for Australia. Um, and I think this would apply to any other country, wherever you're mm -hmm. tuning in from, um, that idea of, you know, um, negating the impacts and then having to deal with the second wave. 
premiers of Australia, at least, have referenced the fact that um, going backwards and locking down once they've opened up is going to be economically disastrous. So that's something that they've been trying to avoid. Um, so in terms of what the impacts might be with that second wave, um, I suspect that people will probably be more heightened and more alert um, after the first and probably um, will more quickly adopt um, the required responses. Um, I was listening to the Chief Medical Officer earlier today talking about the fact that mm -hmm. if there was a second wave, that they suspect that people's behaviours and acceptance of what's required will be a lot easier. They won't need to educate as much. Um, and so that's probably a good sign for operators, particularly in the retail space, in terms of being able to stay open and to operate on that sort of, um, that framework of, you know, minimal people, separation of space, takeaway mm -hmm. services only and so on. Yeah, I think a lot of, um, if there is a second wave, um, in one sense, I'm, up, I'm optimistic about the response and how people will adapt because I think we've already been through the worst in one sense of, in the sense of grappling with the unknown. And so now we've created a lot of systems and observed best practice around the world for how things can be done and how we can respond. So the second wave might not have might not be as bad as the first wave in terms of our response, um, although, you know, it's not an option we want by yes. any means. And hopefully it won't be as severe. Probably we'll be able to more quickly adjust to it. Mm. Um, so for a lot of retailers, um, it should be an easier process, although I'm sure it won't be one that they will embrace. Mm. Um, and hopefully the market's more open-minded about what that means and can adjust their behaviours to suit more quickly. The other point, I guess, in Australia is that we're, we're probably looking at a situation where in Victoria it's more severe than it might be in other mm. parts of Australia. So that second wave won't have the same universal lockdown as it may have um, in early March to mid-March yeah. in many parts of the world. So that hopefully gives you a bit of an indication of some of the good things that are happening in the world. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. we've talked about, and Steph's last quote there talks about the opportunity, and we're very passionate and optimistic about the fact that um, wherever there's change, it doesn't actually mean a, a negative outcome. Um, it can often mean a very positive outcome. Um, who, wherever there's change, there's opportunity to obviously be the first to market, to do things differently, to challenge what has previously been done. And COVID-19, for many property owners, um, will build a sense of resilience and, and agility that we've never had to um, face to this degree before. Um, so if we can deal with this uh, challenging situation, we can almost deal with anything. That's the optimistic way of looking mm -hmm. at it. Yeah, indeed. But, but thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. It's been a pleasure. And we'll release the recording. If any of your colleagues haven't been able to tune in this afternoon, we'll release the recording and place that on our LinkedIn mm -hmm. um, pro, uh, Breakfields profile as well as on our website. Cool. Have and, a good rest um, of the week. Yeah, do reach out if you have any further questions um, beyond this. That's great. Okay, thanks so, thanks much. so much. Bye.